Well, hello everyone and welcome to OYAM 201. I appreciate your patience. I know we're just a couple minutes delayed, but you haven't missed anything. I haven't started without you. And um, it is my pleasure to be here. And we are taking on a big topic today on OYAM 201, tempering chocolate. So for once, I'm not baking. Um, I think it's a very exciting topic, and of course, before I get into tempering chocolate, uh, I want to say the hellos I have to, because of course, I've got so many friends and family joining me, to mom, dad, and Michino, hello, Kathy, to Raf, to Bonnie down the street, I see Hermione, I see Cherry, and for all of you who are returning to the live streams, it's so great to have you here. I've got my laptop set up so I can handle lots of questions. Uh, for those who are new and I've been following the thread to see where you're watching from, welcome and it's my pleasure. So this is meant to be an intensive class on really mastering that step-by-step -step, uh, the method behind tempering chocolate. There are two major ways to do it, seeding and tabling. I'm going to start with tabling. I will do seeding. If you're tempering with me, uh, I'll walk through the tools that we need. Um, if you are seeding chocolate, you just need a metal bowl and a spatula and some chocolate, of course. Uh, if you are tabling the chocolate, you need the metal bowl, the spatula, and then you need a marble or granite or composite surface that is shiny and smooth. It can actually be your kitchen counter or it can be a piece of kitchen counter. You don't have to go out and buy a special marble board for it. Uh, you just want nothing with a pattern or anything that will absorb the chocolate within it. Uh, a thermometer is helpful, not essential. When you're starting out, it's, it's like training wheels. Um, but sometimes you have to learn how to ride a bike without the training wheels. I was taught without the thermometer at first, but now I like to show how to use the thermometer. But before we get too far into things, let's talk about chocolate for a second. You've got um, Couverture baking chocolate that you see here, dark milk and white. This is Calibo brand. It's the, it's the chocolate I use a lot. There are other fabulous, um, couverture chocolates out there. What counts is the word couverture or baking chocolate. That is chocolate that has a higher cocoa butter content so it melts with a beautiful fluidity that means you can stir it into your mousses, your chocolate cake batters, your frostings, your fillings, um, and of course make confections which is what we're doing today. Now you'll see that when it comes to couverture chocolate because you don't find this on candy bars or in chocolate chips that you might use for your chocolate chip cookies that even have a different appearance. And if you were to try and melt regular chocolate chips, you would find they'd be thick and not as glossy as couverture chocolate. But when you buy couverture, it has a percentage on the label. So in the world of dark chocolate, semi-sweet is in the 51 to 65 percent um, of cocoa mass. Any higher than that, and you're looking into uh, bittersweet chocolate, and that percentage refers to the cocoa mass, the combination of cocoa butter and cocoa solids together in the chocolate. Whatever is left, subtracting out of the 100%, is dairy ingredients, vanilla, sugar, flavorings perhaps, and sometimes lecithin or an emulsifier that keeps the chocolate nicely bound together. Uh, I'm just taking a peek. I'm, I'm always keeping a, an eye on the thread. We will, as I'm melting chocolate, have lots of time to answer questions. Um, the chocolate I have here is a semi-sweet and it's 58%. We also have milk chocolate that you see come in these calettes so you don't have to chop your chocolate because you can also buy your couverture chocolate in blocks. This is 32%, meaning there is less cocoa mass, leaving more room for the dairy, the sugar, the flavoring, which is why it's milder and a little sweeter. Then you have your white chocolate, which has no cocoa solids, but it does have the cocoa butter. So I believe technically it still is chocolate, but it's soft and sweet. And what's very important to remember is if you're tempering chocolate, um, you treat your dark chocolate differently than you do your milk and white. Milk and white, because of the lower percentage of cocoa mass, 
melts and sets at a slightly lower temperature, only by about two degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius. But that little difference really is to key, key to getting the proper set. Now, why do you temper chocolate? Well, that's because if you were to just melt chocolate, couverture chocolate, and then make your bonbons or a mondiant or decorating garnishes, it would not set up. Cocoa butter and cocoa solids that make up the cocoa mass, while they grow together in the cocoa bean, actually are two very different ingredients. And they need to be crystallized at the right temperature with a bit of motion in order for them to bond and set up. Um, if you don't temper your chocolate, you will find, yes, you can put it in the fridge, but it'll have a streaky appearance to it. Uh, and when it comes back up to room temperature, it may melt a little bit and it will be not shiny and not have a snap. We want chocolate that has shine, set and snap to it. So what I'm doing is I'm going to start with the tabling method. So this means we're going to melt our chocolate. And you'll see below on the window, all the temperatures are list, uh, listed. So you can go back and refer to them. Um, if you're new to chocolate tempering, just write a little post-it note and put it by your work area so you can refer um, to the temperatures to know you're hitting them. When it comes to melting chocolate for tempering, I prefer using a metal bowl. And I know usually I use glass bowls when I'm doing recipes on this live stream because you can see through them. But a glass bowl heats up well and holds the heat too long. So it can actually push your chocolate beyond the temperature it should reach. Now, what we're gonna do is I find it easiest and more controllable to temper your chocolate using a, a water bath, a bain-marie, a double boiler. So what I have here is a pot filled with just about two or three centimeters of water. And you can see there's steam coming off of the surface of the water, but no bubbles are breaking the surface. We don't want a full boil. And it's actually the heat of the steam coming in contact with the bowl that's gently and slowly melting the chocolate. We, what we want when we're tempering chocolate is control throughout the process. When you're new to tempering chocolate, keep that heat way down low. Give yourself the time and keep track of that temperature. Once you're good at tempering chocolate, you're, you will actually be able to see the temperatures um, visually, what the chocolate looks like, and you can turn up the heat and work a little faster if you wish. But we wanna take this process gradually. Um, you can leave your chocolate when you start melting it for the first couple of minutes. Let the heat get to the bowl. Let the heat start warming the chocolate before you stir it. You don't have to uh, worry about it right now. So this is a good opportunity to make sure that your tabling surface, your marble surface is clean. Um, no lint, no water droplets. So if you just wiped it down, give it a dry with a, a dry towel. The tools you need for tabling are putty knives. And these are just your good old hardware store variety putty knives. When I was in high school, I worked for a painting company that used to, uh, so I used to paint houses. And I didn't know, of course, I was going to be a pastry chef at that time, but I would m love the job of puttying windows. I just found that it was like the precursor to cake decorating, I guess. Um, these are it's, it's just amazingly affordable, easy to find. I've got my bowl, my spatula, and now when it comes to your thermometers, I, there are two options. I like using a digital thermometer because I can drop it right into the chocolate itself uh, and know the true temperature of the chocolate. You never want to touch the end of it directly in contact with the bottom of the bowl because you'll get a warmer reading than is true to the chocolate. Um, and then you've got your surface thermometer which will read the uh, digital temperature on the surface of the chocolate. So this can be a little misleading sometimes. So I'm going to stick with the digital. I happen to have my surface thermometer in metric and I have my digital in Fahrenheit. I learned how to temper chocolate in Fahrenheit, so I tend to think in those numbers. But as you'll see, I both have the metric and the Fahrenheit conversions below. 
now we've got some questions about um, tempering chocolate in the microwave. And yes, you can temper chocolate in the microwave. You have to melt it very gradually. Um, so keep it in a bowl, keep the chocolate not too widely spread out so that the outside edges don't get too hot before the middle melts. And you have to be stopping the microwave every couple of seconds, really every five seconds. Give it a stir, check the temperature, back in until it's fully melted. So the first melt, actually let me bring this back uh, a step. So I'm melting the chocolate and what we need to do to reach temper, to get the cocoa butter and the cocoa solids to bond together is we want to melt the chocolate, then we need to cool down the chocolate, and then we have to actually warm it up just a little bit more at the end. That process is key. So you warm up the chocolate, you cool it down, that's what the table is for, and then you warm it up just slightly again. And that's where the crystallization happens, between the cooling and the rewarming that bonds your chocolate so you can work with it. Now that my chocolate is melting, I want to give it a stir. And so this is 300 grams of chocolate. Um, so 10 ounces, which is a good amount for a couple trays worth of chocolates, whether they be Almond Rocher, Mondiant. Um, if you're starting making bonbons, um, this is a good volume. And for a work surface, the average sort of home kitchen work surface, 300 grams is a manageable amount um, to temper without making too much of a mess. Now, I'm gonna take my bowl off the heat. I still have a little bit of chocolate visible and I don't want to put the hot bowl on my nice cool marble. So I'm putting a towel underneath and I'm just checking the temperature because the first melt we want to be between 45 and 50 Celsius or 113 and 122 Fahrenheit. And I am at, let's see, I'm getting a one, between a 119 and a 120. You always wanna have a little stack of dry paper towels to wipe off your thermometer and a plate to set your spatula and other tools so you don't start making a mess everywhere. So the first thing you wanna make sure is that all your chocolate is fully melted. Look at that beautiful glossiness. And let me just check again. If you go above the temperature, the 45 to 50 Celsius or 113 to 122 Fahrenheit, you actually have to let your chocolate cool down to below that point and start again and then rewarm it. You need these temperature, you need to hit these temperature marks in order to get your chocolate to set fully. So I am in that range. And so now the next move for this, and oh, it's fabulous, we have so many people watching. Thank you for joining. We've got a good amount of likes and you know I like to get the likes so I can tell you what we're doing next week. It's a bit early, so we're at 262 right now. Let's try and get ourselves up to four, and then I'll reveal. Oh, Michael's saying five. By the way, we have Michael behind the camera and Rob moderating the thread. Now, to start tabling, this happens relatively quickly. So now we're gonna cool down the chocolate, and what we need to do is achieve 82 Fahrenheit or 28 Celsius. And so we're using the cool marble surface plus movement. Movement is key in terms of getting chocolate to a proper temper. Now I'm not putting all of the chocolate on the board. I'm putting about two thirds of it. And just to show you, I've got about, I'd say, mm, 60, 70 grams left in the bowl. And put, you can set this on the towel that you um, dried off your chocolate bowl with. That way it keeps it in place. And also we want to keep this chocolate warm. This may be warm enough that once we add the cool chocolate to it, that it will bring that temperature back up. So now it's time to table the chocolate. So we wanna keep it moving. We don't want it sitting still. And you wanna try and work with one putty knife as your dirty one, 
One is your clean. And you just move that chocolate around, spreading it out, cools it down. And you can already see how it's starting to thicken up as you spread it and move it. And after a while, with a bit of practice, you'll, through your sense of touch and by seeing the chocolate, you won't even need the thermometer. You'll tell, you'll be able to tell when you're in that temperature range. So we're looking for 28 Celsius or 82 Fahrenheit. So I'm gonna give this a check. You can check as many times as you want when you're first trying this out. I am already at 82. So now this becomes a bit of an adventure. I've just moved the marble to the edge of the table. And you wanna scrape this chocolate back into the bowl. Oh, did I mention you should also have a wet cloth nearby? Just in case you get, the first time you start tempering chocolate, you will get it everywhere. It just happens. Okay, so now we have the cool chocolate going into the bowl again, and I'm just gonna give the table a little bit of a wipe. I'm not using it again, so I'll put a piece of parchment over it. I just don't want to lean into the chocolate. And if I press this back like that, is that okay, Michael, for okay. angle? Okay. All right. And now I wanna check the temperature again to see how much I need to warm it up to. Because now the final temperature, we want it to be between 88 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 31, 32 Celsius. So I cooled it down and it's sitting around 87. So it can, I warmed it up a little bit. Remember it went down to 82. I've warmed it up now, it's 87. So I'm just going to pop it on the heat for another second, this time constantly stirring. This is very important at this point. You want to make sure you keep stirring the chocolate because movement is the key at this point. And every time you take it off the heat, make sure you wipe the bottom of, of the bowl because water droplets are the enemy of Couverture chocolate. There we go. I am between 88 and 90. I can actually see the chocolate setting up on my palette knife, which that brings up a good point. I'm just gonna put my parchment down to keep my work area clean. So now you want to test. Before you invest all the time and energy into piping your chocolates or your garnishes or using the chocolate, you do wanna check that you have proper temper. So you can dip a piece of parchment into the chocolate and set it on a dry space or you can just put it on a piece of parchment and you've got a couple minutes because this body of chocolate is going to stay warm where this tiny little bit will start setting faster. I can already see I've got temper because it's on my spatulas but I just want to go through that exercise to show you which is um, just so you see it step by step. And I'm going to walk through this entire process with the seeding method with white chocolate so you can see the difference. Uh, I'm just taking a minute to look at the thread while I'm waiting for the chocolate to set up. Uh, two, two, we're all doing well. Thank you, Pastry21. Um, and do you need to chill the stone? Cherry, that's a very good question. No, you don't want to chill the stone because if it goes from uh, the refrigerator or freezer to your work surface, it's going to cool your chocolate too quickly that will seize it. The also, it will create humidity because humidity is the enemy of chocolate during the tempering process. I can see my chocolate is setting at the edge of my bowl here. So I am going to start piping. Yep, and we've got this setting up here. So I'm going to just pull that away. Whoop. Um, and actually to the point, if um, you see when you make your chocolates, after a while, if they've set up and you get streak marks, that is a sign of a fat bloom. Um, so that means the chocolate went through too much of a temperature change. 
Sometimes that can even happen to chocolate that just sits in its container or package for too long. And so the cocoa butter is separating out and rising to the surface of the chocolate. A sugar bloom means humidity got to the chocolate and you see spots on the chocolate. So those are the two things to watch for. So I'm going to put my tray, again, I have my parchment to protect my work surface. I've got a piping bag, and I thought what I'd make with this batch of chocolate is mandion. Just the simple little chocolate wafers that you garnish with different ingredients or flavor. They look absolutely pretty. Um, perfect for spring here in North America. We're heading into our spring season. We're finally getting some not below freezing days here uh, where I live in southern Ontario. And look at that beautiful shine. And there's a thickness to tempered chocolate. It feels very different from when it came off the heat initially. Um, so I gave it that final stir, which is a very important part in the tempering process. And now, and you'll notice you don't use a whisk. And nor do you lift up the spatula. You don't want to over aerate the chocolate that would interfere with that crystallization that is the actual tempering. And now make sure you give the top of your piping bag a good twist. And you don't need a tip when you're piping a chocolate like this, but I won't do too big of an opening. So now to pipe mandion, you want to pipe straight, straight down and make little wafers. And there's a natural spread, but you can see Unlike fluid, untempered chocolate, there's body to the piping. And look at that shine. It's glorious. So once it sets, it will, be, it will have a satin finish to it. And if you're getting into fancy chocolate work and making bonbon, uh, bonbons, then you'll find that the polycarbonate molds offer a great deal of shine to your chocolates. And they actually look like they're wet. Now, when I'm doing mandillon or chocolate, chocolates like this with tempered chocolate, because the chocolate starts setting up so much, I pipe half a tray, and then I garnish, and then I pipe the second half of the tray because it can be setting up before you even finish getting to the end of the tray. There we go. Set that back in my jar. Now you wanna give the tray a little tap just to flatten out the peaks. Now let's talk about some of the accents that you can use. Uh, for my dark chocolate, I've got dried cherries, toasted peeled hazelnuts, and candied ginger. So what you want are ingredients that will not let off moisture into the chocolate because then they'll pull away, they'll fall out, um, and you'll get the sugar bloom on the chocolate. So just carefully. If you're doing this for, to, to give to people, this I'm making just for Michael and myself and Bonnie. I know I'll bring some to you later. Um, I'm just using my fingers, but you can use tweezers or gloved hands to do this. Uh, it's a good habit. If you have uh, well-fitting latex gloves, that works well with chocolate tempering so that you don't get your oils um, on the surface and mark your beautiful chocolates. Now, while I'm garnishing these with a hazelnut, a dried cherry, and a piece of candied ginger. Uh, I'm gonna take a few questions. I think I can talk and, and um, garnish at the same time. Ooh, we're getting some good questions here. Once the temper chocolate is tempered, how long do you have to use it? Fantastic question. Um, you've got about 10 to 15 minutes for a measurement like this. The more chocolate you have, the longer it will hold its heat. So if you're only melting a little bit for a garnish, 100 grams or so, well, you have to use it within five to 10 minutes. 300 grams, double the amount. We've got about 10 to 15 here. Um, and the closer it is together, now that it's in the piping bag and it's together, it will hold the heat for a little bit longer versus being spread out in this form where it will set up faster. Now I'm going to add my Candy ginger, you can buy tools and machines that keep the chocolate at an even temperature and moving 
um, but you have to be really serious about your candy making work if you're going to invest in one of those. What's amazing is you can find so much online these days. Oh, I can already see where my first chocolates are starting to set up. And now I'm going to continue with the rest. Maybe decorate them a little differently. And I'll just make sure sometimes the chocolate right at the tip of the piping bag, because it's tempered, starts setting up. So you have to, there we go, loosen it up a little bit. So now I'll pipe the rest. As a note, when you're making a candy like this, when you are making confections with straight tempered chocolate, you cannot add flavoring ingredients, especially liquids, to the chocolate. It will seize the chocolate. It'll interfere with that crystallization between the cocoa butter and the cocoa solids, and you won't get the correct temper. But that's why you count on fillings if you're making bonbons, adding nuts. You can coat any kind of nuts. Rocher, uh, almond rocher, are simply toasted almonds with a little bit of usually with a little icing sugar, um, and then you toss that in tempered chocolate and you make those lovely little nut clusters, which are delicious. I don't wanna get this in the way. So now I'll finish. You've also got other ingredients. I have dried cranberries, pistachios, and dried blueberries I can add. So how about some cranberries for a little tang? The pistachios are so pretty. I'm gonna mix them up a bit. I'll put some blueberries in some. Have, this, have all your ingredients ready before you start your tempering process. You wanna be ready to go, because when that chocolate tells you it's ready, it is ready to go. And additionally, I have candied uh, flowers. I have candied rose petals and candied violets, which just add a beautiful pop of color and character. And because chocolate is fat-based, that crystallized outside will stay nice and crunchy. And that's why items like candied ginger and candied violets work. Uh, and if you're going to put anything like candied orange peel on, make sure that it is fully drained and you've given it time to dry on a rack. Uh, give it a little roll in sugar just to absorb any liquid because that too would create a sugar bloom on top of your beautifully tempered chocolate. So the whole idea is that you don't have to let the, um, the you don't have to hold the chocolate in the fridge. You don't want to hold the chocolate in the fridge because then you will develop that sugar bloom um, from humidity. You do want to pop the chocolate in the fridge for just only two minutes after you've completed your chocolates. Oh my gosh, in all my talking, this chocolate is setting up. I gotta work a little faster. Focus, focus. There we go. So now the final step, um, and I learned this from a dear friend, Philippe, who was a Parisian trained chocolatier who worked at Le Notre, and he, picked, he had all the chocolate tricks. He was amazing. And he said, the two key secrets to tempering chocolate is after you hit the right temperature, give it a good 30 seconds of a vigorous stir. And after you've assembled your chocolates, pop them in the fridge for just two to three minutes because that contracts the crystals and then it guarantees you get the beautiful shine and set and then they pull away easily from your baking tray or your molds. So I don't know, did you get a good pan, Michael? Because you can see already where one side of the tray is fully set and where the other side is close to being set. So just the matter of my five minutes here has made all the difference. Ah, Lisa asks a good question. Do I add any oil to my melted chocolate as it's melting for strawberry dipping? If you're tempering the chocolate, you don't have to. The only time I add oil, butter, corn syrup is if I'm putting a softer chocolate coating on a cake or for the case of strawberries, you can um, to make it easier to cut or bite through. But it will interfere with the tempering chocolate. So just keep your chocolate pure. So if I can give that to you, two minutes in the fridge. Uh, and I will keep my eyes on that. 
And that will let me um, move on to the seeding method. So this you might have been really interested in. So we are not going to use the marble board at all. I'm going to leave my parchment here to keep my work area clean. Generally, as a rule, I like to work with white chocolate first and then dark chocolate just for the simple ease of cleanliness. Uh, but this is easy enough to man manage. So as I said, when it comes to seeding chocolate, all you need is your metal bowl, your chocolate, and a clean spatula. And I have 300 grams of white chocolate, so I'm going to seed temper white chocolate. Um, so the first thing you do is you don't have to weigh it specifically, but you want to put two thirds of your white chocolate in your metal bowl and then hold back a third because that is what is going to be used to seed the chocolate after it has melted. So you've got a little wiggle room. If you're new to tempering chocolate, you can, you still have to add um, a little bit of chocolate. You can add less, so hold back less. So as opposed to a third, hold back a quarter of the chocolate. It means you'll spend more time stirring to lower the temperature, but it gives you more wiggle room, more control, because you want to make sure the chocolate is fully melted. I'm gonna move my dark chocolate paper towel out of the way. Now, the white chocolate's going to go on the heat. Same level of heat, a low temperature, the steam is melting the white chocolate. Your temperature range now is lower. So instead of 113 to 122 Fahrenheit, you need to melt it between 104 and 113. You don't want to cross, uh, cross 113. Um, that's 40 to 45 Celsius. And then we cool it down to about the same temperature, slightly lower. So 27 to 28 Celsius or 81 to 82 Fahrenheit. And that is just two degrees less than the dark chocolate. And then we bring it back up to two degrees less than the dark chocolate again, 84 to 86 Fahrenheit or 29 to 30 Celsius. That's a lot of numbers to throw at you. You don't have to be writing it down. Everything's right below. And after these chocolates, now these have been in the fridge for just two minutes. Thank you, Michael. And I just wanna show you, so a well-tempered chocolate should pull, pull away easily without leaving a mark on the chocolate that was only in the fridge two minutes. It's got a nice satin top to it. And then you should hear that little snap. And that means you got a proper set to your chocolate. I'm not gonna eat it now because then I'll get chocolate all over, but I'll save that for later. And let's take a look at our white chocolate melting. So again, white chocolate is melting at a lower temperature, so you really do wanna pay attention to it. It melts faster than dark for that reason. And it has a beautiful fluidity to it. If you're ordering your Couverture chocolate online, certain brands like Valrona do come in other flavors. So you can buy Yuzu and passion fruit. They've already worked the flavor into it, so it's very, very handy. If there's a recommendation I make, if you're trying melting white, uh, tempering white chocolate for the first time, melt it, um, have your heat lower than what you melted your dark chocolate, just so you don't break that temperature threshold and go above uh, 45 Celsius or 113 Fahrenheit. Um, if you do, I actually did that when I made my Mondion to get ready. I made some ahead of time. Um, is I went over the temperature. So all I did was I added more chocolate to cool it down below 104 or 40 Celsius. Then I, you start again. So that's in order to start again, if you break temper, you fall out of that temperature range, you need to cool it down to before the initial temperature you need to start with. And I'm gonna pay attention because I don't want that to happen again. Now I know I'm not there because because I have still some visible chocolate, but we're getting close. So a final stir here, make sure it's melted, and then 
The rule doesn't change. You pull your bowl off the heat, wipe it dry so no water droplets are going to risk falling into your bowl. I'll give this a little check. And now it's time to cool the chocolate down. So you add those reserved third of white chocolate chips. And this is where motion is key. So with the tabling, we had the motion as I was spreading out the chocolate and then scraping it up again to bond the cocoa butter and cocoa solid crystals together. Now we're relying on simply stirring. So no whisking, we don't want air in there. And you can lift the chocolate a little bit, but you don't wanna be woo in the air with it too much. We don't want little air bubbles in there. And so the chocolate you added should pretty much melt fully. And now this is where you have to be patient and just keep stirring. So seeding can take a little bit longer. It's not as glamorous as the slathering of the chocolate on the table, but it's tidier and you will get there and you can really spread that chocolate around your bowl. Your bowl is now cooling. It's definitely important when you're seeding, uh, seed tempering white chocolate, don't use a glass bowl. It just holds the heat far too long. Uh, and yes, just a reminder, that's a very good point. Uh, Shemit, you, you noted that if you have to leave the live stream, don't worry, this will get posted on the channel so you can come back to it and refer to the tempering method that you may wish to take on. Um, oh, here's a good question. Ahmad's asking, can you mix different chocolates for seeding? Yes, you can, um, but be aware of what the dominant chocolate is. The temperature range between the white and milk um, is one area, but you, um, if you're melting like dark and white together, you might as well just melt milk chocolate unless that's not available to you. Um, something that is worth considering, if you want to color your chocolate, I have here, these, this is colored cocoa butter, which I'm gonna add a little pink. I should have added it while I was melting. Hopefully it'll melt in now. And this is a great way if you wanna color your chocolate for candy making. There we go, it's adding a nice pink color. What you cannot use are water-based uh, coloring. So this you're used to using in your buttercreams, your frostings, your macarons, um, but you don't want to use this in your chocolate because it will seize up your chocolate. So you need to use a cocoa butter based coloring. There we go. I've got a nice little pink tone to my white chocolate. And there are now, you can find ruby chocolate on the market, which is a different type of cocoa bean altogether that lends that natural pink color and a bit of a, strangely, it turns out a berry taste to it. Um, you can also buy caramel chocolate. And if you've ever tried roasting white chocolate, it's absolutely amazing. Um, and it lends a caramel f flavor to white chocolate that is just absolutely delightful. Um, um, Mesro is saying, when we make chocolate shells, you use coconut oil or cocoa butter. Yes, you can add coconut oil or cocoa butter to your chocolate in small amounts. It makes it a little softer. If you don't want that snap so much, you won't get that perfect snap, but you have to be careful on what it is being used for. That's a lovely color. And now I should check my temperature. I am getting down to, oh, I'm still a little warm, 96. So just taking a little bit longer. We're just, this is what, this is why I wanted to do the tabling first. So you can see how fast it was. This simply takes the time it does to set up. I can also rush it a little bit in case you have to go anywhere and do a little piping for you. And I don't know if you can tell, Michael, if you want to do the overhead cam, I can tell it's not cooled enough because see how it's pooling right in the bottom of the bowl? It just, it needs more time to cool down just a little bit more. But it's nice and smooth. Everything's well melted. So if you're pressed for time, seating is not the method. Tabling is the method to go. But it is a little more cleanup time at the very end. but I'm developing a nice glossiness here, so 
the coolness of the marble table is just fine. As a note, if you do a lot of chocolate tempering or you're in a warmer climate, if you're um, finding your marble surface gets warm, what you do is take a resealable bag full of ice cubes or if you have some frozen peas and you rub that on the surface of your table, that'll cool it down. Just make sure you dry the surface thoroughly in case any moisture comes up. But then it'll cool down your, your surface so you can continue with your tempering. Um, oh, Lucia is asking a good question. Can you use this seeding technique for dark chocolate? Yes, you can. Either technique works fine with all three types of chocolate. It's just a different method depending on the tools you have. An excellent question to ask. Um, and there are, now we've got questions about Hershey's chocolate chip and Baker's chocolate. Hershey's chocolate chips are not designed for tempering. They're great for chocolate chip cookies, but they're designed to hold their shape. So that's a good question and they won't be, uh, but you find you, you can't temper them. They won't melt smoothly or with a shine to it. Baker's chocolate can be tempered. It is couverture baking chocolate designed for that. Um, so that can be used too. So you start playing different pastry chefs and chocolatiers like different brands of chocolate. You'll find what works for you. You can order so many different types online. Um, so taste the chocolates that you like best and then you can go with the one that are your, ones that are your favorite. Ah, and Kuro's asking a question. Um, how do I stop white chocolate from hardening so quickly? It's all about the temperature. If you hit a proper temper with your white chocolate, just like the dark chocolate, you should have about 10 to 15 minutes to start working with it. You can always, if you take your, your water bath off the heat, if you find your chocolate in your bowl is starting to, say you're dipping strawberries, is starting to set around the edges, not on the heat, but just the carryover heat from your pot, you can pop the bowl back on the heat just to warm it up a little bit without breaking that temper temperature. And then you'll get a couple more, you know, another five, 10 minutes out of your chocolate. Stirring is the key. And, oh, we've got a question about tempering chocolate using sous vide. I have not tried that. So I imagine you could, but uh, motion is a key part to tempering. You've got time, temperature, and motion. So I'm not sure how you get the motion in there um, to really hit that. Oh, and it's cooling down all of a sudden. We're getting close within a couple of degrees. These are great questions, so keep them coming. Um, and Mukhtar, you want to make chocolate using cocoa liquor and cocoa butter. So you're getting kind of the fundamental raw ingredients and you want to put them together. Um, that will take some fiddling around and it takes, I think, different equipment. That's an area of expertise. I wouldn't want to weigh in too heavily on because that's not mine. I actually have, know someone who's starting their own uh, chocolate business in Costa Rica, buying the beans in the raw state, um, shelling them, fermenting them, roasting them, grinding them and making her own chocolate. And it is an arduous process. I do know that. So I appreciate the work that goes into it. All right. Oh. And as Katie said, 40 more likes to go. And I can tell you what we are doing next week. And I can tell you, you definitely want to come back next week because it is, it's going to be a fun one. I'm really excited about it. Um, oh, here's a good question from Kin. Can Baker's chocolate be used when making hot chocolate? Oh, yes. It is so good. It makes the best hot chocolate because it's designed to be melted. All right, I can feel we're getting cooler. I can feel it, I can feel it. I can see the gloss coming through on my chocolate. And there we go. So now it's time to bring it up. This won't take but a second. Bring it up just two degrees. And then Michael, should I do more Mondiant or pipe some garnishes? Mondiant. Okay. If I, I will have some extra chocolate so I can show you how to pipe some garnishes. I think we're doing okay for time. That should be all it takes to heat up the chocolate. I just want to keep it away. I don't want to warm my work area. 84, 85, 86. There we go. So I've got another piping bag handy. 
So just a reminder, that was a cocoa butter based uh, color that I added to the chocolate. For a nice peachy tone, you can go very vibrant. The more cocoa butter you add, the more color you'll get. And let me work so you can capture it. Put it in my piping bag. Scrape out every last bit. And I do have an extra tray that I can pipe some garnishes with. And these take on an altogether different look. I love the mix of the white and the dark side by side on a little candy plate. And away we go. If you wanted to add toffee bits, pretzel pieces, because as the chocolate sets and it sets so quickly, it won't add moisture to whatever toppings you add to your mondial. So nuts stay nice and crunchy, so do pretzel pieces. And you could use this chocolate. If you ever make chocolate bark, this is the method to get the best chocolate bark and you won't get those streaks and it will just keep forever. Don't forget, a little tap. And I think I'm gonna go with cranberry, pistachio, and then the rose petal here. I think I'll just do half a tray because you've already seen me do this. And then let me pipe some garnishes quickly. And I think then you'll have all the skills you need to start playing with tempering chocolate and its uses too. It's chocolate dipped strawberry season. Isn't it funny how chocolate dipped strawberries went out of fashion for about 15 years, but they are back more popular than ever. I think the pink on pink is a pretty combination here. So these are the candied rose petals and I just bought them online. Over the last two years, a lot of bakery suppliers have taken to selling their goods online so you can buy ingredients that you wouldn't normally be able to find uh, in a retail environment, which is fantastic. So now I'll use the second half of this tray to show you some basic garni piping garnishes. So the first thing I want to do is I want to make a small piping bag. so that um, I can hold it in my, pan my hand, almost like a pencil. The um, large piping bag is just too hard to handle with any precision. So to make a little bonus tip here, to make a, um, oh, 10 more likes to go, Katie. Thanks for keeping <laughs> tabs on things. Oh, no, only five left, woo. Um, to make a parchment pastry cone, you think of this, the center of the longest, um, side of the triangle as the center of the piping tip. And then you bring your, all your corners together by wrapping them around and they meet at that right angle, like so. So I hope that's clear, I'll do it again. So fold them around and they meet at the right angle at the top. Then you can't use tape on your piping bag, it won't, or on your parchment, it won't stick. Fold it over a few times at the crease, and there you go. You have your pastry cone. All right, we're, we've hit over 500. Guess what I'm making next week? This time next week, 12 noon Eastern time on Thursday, I am making macaron. You've been waiting for a live stream macaron, and this is my Swiss method for macaron, which I have to say, you can find the French and the Italian method right here on the OEM channel. The Swiss, I think, is my favorite. I absolutely love it, so I can't wait to share that with you next week. So we really are getting serious here on OEM 201. I'm squeezing some of my tempered chocolate into my piping bag. Not too much. You don't want to overfill it.
And then everybody folds their piping bag differently, depending on what works for your hand. I'll just do a little whoop, check my, if I need to snip the tip, I'm good. So now repetition is key. Practice, practice, practice. I have horrible handwriting, but I can pipe happy birthday <laughs> in chocolate. But some of the basic garnishes, you have to build strength in the garnish by a, a repetitive pattern. And so here's one basic one. You've probably all seen these on classic European style desserts. So I hold from the top and I use my left hand to kind of guide my other hand along, or you've got the elongated. I kind of move my whole body into this. Oh, it's been a while since I've had to do this. So the more layers, the stronger the garnish is. And I saw a note just as I put my head down about someone ending up with hollow shells when they make Swiss method macarons. So I will cover all that when you join me this time next week. Oh, great. Oh, and someone just re got their silicone mat. So you are all set for making macarons. And a lot of the chocolate tips that I picked up um, from my friend Chef Philippe, I also picked up a lot of macaron tips from him too. So I'm happy to share those. And so this is similar to the one I just did, just with straighter angles. I'll do one more. When I went to culinary school and we went through the chocolate tempering exercise, the rule was the sh chef professor had to see you properly temper chocolate and then you had to pipe a full tray of garnishes to his or her satisfaction before you were allowed to leave at the end of the day. It was a great exercise in learning how to temper chocolate. Repetition and practice is the key. Michael, I'll pass these, ooh, that's setting up nicely. Pass these to you, just for that two minutes, only two minutes in the fridge, just to set it. And here we go. These are the, the white chocolate ones I made earlier with different flower petals and you can see you've got the set, the shine, and the snap. Oh, there it is. Now I can have a bite. Mm. Such an absolute treat. I really hope I gave you that insight, that step-by-step -step in understanding what is behind tempering chocolate, why you need to do it, the difference between the two methods. Time, temperature, and motion is key. And of course, mm, some delicious chocolate helps. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Your questions um, have been fantastic. Last question in there. Yes, after your chocolate sets up, look at my chocolate from earlier, completely set up in its bag now. It's a solid mass. You have to re-temper it again. So take it out of the bag. Never throw your unused chocolate away. You can just save it, chop it up, and re-melt it, but you have to go through that temperature pro process again. Great question to wrap things up on. I love getting your questions. This is what makes these live streams so dynamic, is the conversation, knowing I'm hitting on the questions that you are most interested in. I hope this has been a, a great lesson for you. I love playing with chocolate. Now it's your turn. And I will see you next week for Swiss Macaron. Bye, everyone. Keep it sweet. Mm. <laughs> Bye. Caught me with my mouthful.